Hello, this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy and editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. Today, with the pleasure of uh, speaking with Joshua Malden, who is at the Center of Theological Inquiry in Princeton, New Jersey, with a fascinating new book out on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Karl Barth, and modern politics. Uh, Josh, it's great to have you with us. Th great. Thanks, Mark. Great, great to be here. And if you could hold your book up for a moment so we could take a glance. Bart Bonhoeffer and Modern Politics. So tell us why are Karl Barth, Karl Barth Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Modern Politics a timely topic for today? Well, it's funny you say that. I, uh, I've been sending the book around, and a lot of people do always say, well, that sounds very timely. I The first copies of it arrived on my doorstep and you know how these books take you know forever to uh, kind of go all the way from beginning to getting it in hand and the moment when they arrived on my doorstep the capital was under siege and I was sort of someone might think oh that sort of makes it seem more timely at the time I was sort of sort of so much upset by this whole situation that I, I just left the books out there for I think the whole day, maybe around 10 p.m. that night, I finally got them because I was sort of uh, so much, it seemed that so much was changing in society. Um, but why is it timely? Uh, two topics I was interested in that got me to writing the book were theories of liberalism, theories of modern politics that focus on you know, critiques of liberalism, think about people like Alistair McIntyre, Brad Gregory, Patrick Deneen. But I was also interested in Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And one of the themes I was particularly interested in was how the whole history of the National Socialism, the Third Reich, the Holocaust, plays a key role in theories of modern politics, whether it's seen as a kind of warning sign of any kind of uh, backsliding away from liberalism, or whether it's seen as a kind of culmination of the problems of liberalism. So I thought it was a natural fit to bring these two theologians, Bart and Bonhoeffer, who lived during the rise of National Socialism in Germany. And although, especially with Bart, you don't necessarily see them writing explicitly on that topic, you know, you have to kind of dig deeper to find the, their, their thoughts on those topics it seemed to be a natural fit to think about these theological figures in the midst of these broader debates. Is it accurate to describe both Barth and Bonhoeffer as liberals in the political sense, supporters of liberal democracy? Yeah, it's a complicated topic. Um, I, I basically try to use them to defend a, an account of liberal democracy. Of course, by that word, you know, what do I mean? I mean it in the broadest sense. I don't mean it, of course, in the sense of a kind of progressive politics. I mean it in the sense that would encompass a, kind of a conservative a right form of liberalism and Republicans in the United States, for example, as well as uh, liberal progressive Democrats in the United States. So it's a, a broad sense of a, a conception of political life that in some sense is focused on individual freedom and individual dignity. So I think that part of what liberalism means is you have to build a structure of society that recognizes the individual as important. You can't just sort of say, here's a social problem, let's solve it without any regard to individual freedom. Um, and basically, I try to argue that Barton Bonhoeffer support that, although, you know, there's a lot of debates about whether Bonhoeffer thought that Germany, for example, could be a democracy. And he had some skepticism about that. But I think, on the whole, you can argue that both of them thought that the modern political settlement was itself an achievement as opposed to a kind of decline from some prior golden age, if that makes sense. Now, you mentioned uh, Patrick Deneen, who uh, essentially despairs of American democracy. What would, uh, say, Karl Barth, Barth say today regarding that argument or perspective? Yeah, Deneen's book I've read, and 
it was sort of out too late for me to deal with a lot. Uh, I kind of footnote it and reference it. I'm more focused on Alistair McIntyre, Brad Gregory, who's a historian, and Stanley Hauerwas. I mean, McIntyre is, in, in, in one sense, I think, the kind of source of a lot of these criticisms, uh, both with, so I think Deneen is drawing on McIntyre to a great extent, Brad Gregory is, and so is Hauerwas. I think, um, I, I do think that Bart has more of a sense of a theological framework undergirding kind of liberal politics. He's more positive about it than a, a Deneen would be. And that gets very complicated. I kind of go into it in the book. In one sense, what I want to say is, and I draw on this in chapter three in the chapter on Bonhoeffer is, with both Bart and Bonhoeffer, you have an account of the ultimate that makes the penultimate possible. Those are Bonhoeffer's terms, but I think he's drawing on a kind of Bardian theology there. And in both cases, there is a danger of politics when it doesn't have the ultimate. So there's a, there's a critique of secularism there. When you don't have a sense of the ultimate, the penultimate, that is the kind of secular sphere, is always in danger of becoming the ultimate. There's a kind of religious tendency in humanity that if you have a politics that doesn't have an account of the ultimate and in a sense of the divine, you're going to have a politics that itself tries to become religious in some nature. So that's in a sense the dark side of what we might call modern politics in general. I think there is a kind of theological, eschatological stream of modern politics. And that's why I talk about modern politics as the title of the book, as opposed to just liberalism as a political philosophy. And I think someone like Deneen is, is sort of homing in on that, that danger. But I think what you see with Barton Bonhoeffer is an ability to diagnose that danger, but also to recognize the achievements of modern politics. I'm sure you've noticed there is a modern tendency to uh, exploit uh, Bonhoeffer, whatever evil we perceive ourselves to be fighting today. We're just like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his struggles. So how do you contend with that temptation? I focus on that quite a bit in chapter four. And I think in some ways that's one of the more interesting chapters. There's a book by Stephen Haynes called The Battle for Bonhoeffer. And I read that a couple of years ago, actually. This was off after I'd already written much of this book. And he basically is, uh, and maybe you've, you've seen that book, Mark. It, it's very interesting. He's kind of giving a, a history of the reception of Bonhoeffer, particularly in the United States in the last, say, 40 years. One of the things he notes is that every president, since Ronald Reagan at least, has been likened to Hitler. And in each of these cases, uh, you have somebody who's likening themselves to a kind of Bonhoeffer who's over against the, the Hitler who's in power. And what you saw a lot, especially, well, really it's been for about 15 years is the declaration of various Bonhoeffer moments. And these are moments when someone says, okay, we're now in a Bonhoeffer moment, we have to resist, we have to overthrow, we have to do something of this nature. What I argue in the chapter is actually, it's very vague exactly what is being declared in that moment. For example, is it being declared that we need to actually overthrow the government, participate in some kind of violent action? Oftentimes people who, who declare a Bonhoeffer moment at the very last moment, <laughs> as it were, they pull back and say, we're not calling for any kind of uh, violent insurrection. We're only calling for asking the kind of questions Bonhoeffer raised, such as who is Christ for us today? A kind of innocuous uh, theological question, we might say. What I argue in the chapter is if we want to really think about Bonhoeffer and his account of political resistance, we should think about the divine mandates. And in a sense, I'm saying, let's not only think about Bonhoeffer as this kind of empty vessel in whom we can pour whatever political ideology we have, but let's actually think about what he thought of as what politics needs to be in order to sustain a society over time. So he has this idea of these various social spheres that constitute 
society. And he thinks even in a modern and protect, especially in a modern society, you need these various spheres, spheres like the state, religion or the church, family and marriage and work or culture. And his key point is these various spheres of society are sort of ordered by separate norms. And it's very important that the norms of one or the other not entrench upon the other spheres. So I, I make this whole argument that if we really want to sort of think about Bonhoeffer during a time of political tumult, let's think about these divine mandates and what they have to say about what kinds of societies we need to build in order both to keep tyranny at bay, also to keep anarchy at bay, and to build up societies that can endure through time. Both uh, Bonhoeffer and Barth, can people of today on both the political right and left look to them for guidance or can one side uh, claim any kind of ownership over one or the other? I certainly think uh, more the, more the uh, I think you, the former where both, both sides can, can uh, learn a lot from both of them. I, um, <clears throat> there are kind of, yeah, there are left and right, uh, you know, interpretations of both. To some extent, people are always a little more surprised that I, I bring Bart in on this because I think he's seen by some as, you know, a kind of conservative, uh, dogmatic thinker who is more focused on the, the integrity of the Christian message than he is on any kind of political questions. Whereas Bonhoeffer is seen more as a kind of political liberal, uh, Protestant liberalism, we might say. Um, it, what's interesting is in writing the book, I found to some extent a little bit of the opposite. Um, with Bonhoeffer, he has some chapters in ethics, uh, his ethics manuscript, especially a chapter called Heritage and Decay, where he does actually, even though I'm arguing more for the a kind of positive argument about democracy, he does to some extent see modern secular society as, as in some sense losing its Christian heritage. And in some sense, he's arguing that that's what has caused in his time, the 1930s, 1940s, this civilizational collapse. And he does argue for a kind of retrieval of a theological and indeed a Christian framework uh, to bind society together. So in some ways, it, I ended up finding a little bit different from what I expected. And my impression of uh, Bart, uh, perhaps unfair, is that while he was uh, in uh, some sense uh, prophetic in his um, denunciation of the, of the evils of the Third Reich, that uh, during the Cold War, he was not as um, outspoken or perceptive about uh, the threats to freedom that the Soviet Union posed. Is that a fair impression? It is. I mean, I actually just wrote a chapter on um, for the Oxford Handbook of Reinhold Niebuhr and it's specifically on Niebuhr and Karl Barth's interactions, which, as you know, uh, very much centered on this question as we got into the 1940s, 50s, 60s. Barth wanted to maintain, well, I think there's two things. I mean, I think one, he was called the red pastor of Zoffenville in, in Switzerland, where he was a pastor. And he did maintain, uh, he certainly was a social democrat throughout his life. So he had a kind of sense of social democracy that he thought was necessary. And in his view, uh, whether right or wrong, American uh, form of capitalism was a threat to that, as well as the Soviet Union. And, you know, he might have even argued in a, some sense, well, and here's what I argue in the book too, in, in this separate context. Bart, Bart always wanted, he always focused what he said, at least in his political statements on who he was who he was talking to. And a lot of what we read in, in this debate about the Cold War and so on, when he was speaking to American audiences, he really wanted to not be sort of brought in to a kind of uh, yeah, anti-Soviet Cold War ideology. When he was speaking to, say, Hungarians, he, he, would, he could be more critical of the Soviet Union. I think he always thought that uh, uh, kind of Niborians, Niebuhr himself, American ideology was going to sort of co-opt the Christian message for its own kind of uh, Cold War ideology. That's what I would say to that. And of course, Bart uh, 
Bonhoeffer and Niebuhr were thrown into the same pot in terms of being neo-Orthodox, whatever that means. But obviously they were very different personalities and had very different beliefs. And as you mentioned, uh, some debate between Niebuhr and Bart. Uh, how would you summarize their differences and their commonalities? Between all three? Yeah. yeah. You know, Bart and Niebuhr, for one thing, and this is what I argue in this chapter that I've just written, um, I, what, I think Niebuhr and Bart were actually sort of vocationally doing very different things. Bart wrote this, you know, massive church dogmatics, which was focused on, in some sense, describing the Christian faith, and it was very much doing it for pastors, preachers in the pulpit. He has these short paragraphs at the top of each section of this, you know, huge multi-volume thing. Each of his doctrines, he has a little paragraph at the top where he kind of summarizes it. And people notice that and, and don't necessarily think too much about it. What I found very fascinating in doing some historical reading on his biography, on Bart's biography, he had this same framework way back when he was in his 20s and was teaching confirmation classes to adolescents in the Alpine village in Switzerland, where he was a pastor for 10 years. Basically, this was a way that he was teaching the Christian faith to, to young people who were just uh, learning about it. And he continued this same basic framework throughout his life in writing the Church Dogmatic. So, I mean, I think Bart was very much focused on how do we re-describe, re-narrate the Christian faith for people who are going to actually be proclaiming it from the pulpit as pastors. Niebuhr was also a professor at a seminary and interestingly enough was a pastor in Detroit for 13 years during a pretty much the same time that Bart was a pastor. So they were both pastors uh, as their first kind of positions in life. And then Niebuhr became a, a seminary professor. So he also was working in the seminary, but in a very different way very much more focused in a, in a sort of American sense on politics, on how the Christian faith would relate to the state in the United States. And I, I think he just always had a different vocation, even while he was training ministers. And uh, of course, Niebuhr was considered a, a founder of contemporary Christian realism. Would Bart or Bonhoeffer subscribe to uh, any aspect of Christian realism or self-identified as such? They didn't identify uh, as such, but I think there are certainly certain themes of Christian realism that they would have subscribed to, if we put it that way. You know, Robin Lovin has his book on Christian realism and uh, Reinhold Niebuhr and Christian realism, where he argues that Christian realism is defined by three forms of realism, moral realism, theological realism, and political realism. And all three are kind of interrelated, but they're not the same thing. You know, theological realism being that there really is a God. God is real and is a sort of actor and subject in history. Is not just a kind of projection of human needs and so on. Moral realism, the idea that our our moral claims actually attach to something real in the world. They're not just, it's not a moral relativism. It's not that we just make up rules in order to organize our lives. We actually, there actually are objective moral norms. And uh, political realism, which is in some ways what Niebuhr is most known for, but this, this kind of sense of our political lives, especially at the international level, can't be organized around purely ideals, but have to be organized around basically what the facts of human nature, the facts of human desire for power and so on and so forth. So all three of those are key to Christian realism as Niebuhr understood it, I would argue. And I think all three Bonhoeffer and Bart would have subscribed to. The only question might've been what would their view of political realism have been? Maybe they would have been a, a little less Maybe they would have been a little more optimistic, we could say. Uh, but I'll leave that as a question. And uh, perhaps today uh, we need some uh, political optimism. I think that's I think that's right. I you know one of the figures 
who I found very interesting and, and I used in the book, even though he's in some ways not popular, or at least this book, is Francis Fukuyama. I'm very interested in his book, The End of History and the Last Man. You know, this was back in 1990 and that he wrote this, or 91. And you'll remember the, the publication of that, Mark, and how it was, it sort of caused a, it was a lot of controversy. And, and even to this day, part of the reason I, I wanted to use it is I think a lot of people read that, or a lot of people criticize that book often, I think, without having read it, because it's a much more subtle argument than is often given credit. But the key point there being in, in the book that at that time he was arguing that liberal democracy had no sort of normative rivals in the world. There were a few kind of, there was certainly still countries that were not liberal democracies, but even those usually tried to defend their claims in terms of liberal democracy. They maybe even had democratic, you know, in the title of their, their country's name. Uh, and so far as they weren't democratic, they argued that this was just a way station on the way to a democratic society and so forth. And a lot of people, I think, were actually upset by Fukuyama's, in a sense, optimism, in a sense, to get to your point, Mark, that he was too optimistic that this would kind of continue. Of course, today, in a sense, you could argue that the critics have been proven right. And so far as you've got a lot, you've got countries like China, which are you know, growing stronger and stronger on an authoritarian model. They're not democratizing in the way that even as recently as 2001, people thought and or hoped they would. But I still think, I think there's something to be said that we, we need an optimism, particularly around the question of liberal democracy, we need optimism. We need optimism that even in the wake of threats, even in the wake of all the kind of recriminations, partisan infighting we see, that in the longer term, I think democracy will endure. Joshua Malden, author of Bart Bonhoeffer and Modern Politics, thank you for a fascinating conversation. Thanks, Mark.